Johannes Gutenberg was voted man of the millennium back in the year 2000. Interestingly, all of the um, surveys, Slime Magazine, Newspeak, Useless News and World Report, all of them, they all put Gutenberg as the man of the millennium. And can you imagine why? Well, he's the inventor of the printing press, without which you couldn't have the information revolution, you couldn't have the uh, mass media we've got in the world today. At the end of the 20th century, a lot of publications were discussing who's the most important people of the millennium. And Martin Luther was in every list in the top 10, but Johannes Gutenberg was at the top of the list. Everyone's top 10, and many voted him the most important man of the millennium. Well, if you're in print medium, you can understand why they might say so. Johannes Gutenberg was born in the city of Mainz, on, near the shores of the Rhine River. His father, Friel Genschlisch, married Elsa van Gutenberg, who gave her name to her second son, um, Johannes. That sounds a whole lot easier to pronounce than Genschfleisch, uh, would be a kind of interesting name for the first Bible. As a young boy, Johannes developed an insatiable appetite for knowledge reading every book he came across, but all books at that time were handwritten, of course, immensely expensive. During his teen years, Johannes and his family were forced into exile twice due to political infighting and conflicts where they were on the wrong side of the political divide. Johannes traveled from town to town, studying monuments, visiting men who were renowned for their knowledge in science and art or trades. And he traveled alone, he traveled on foot, he carried a knapsack, with his precious books and clothes. And as an itinerant student, he traveled throughout Italy, Switzerland, Germany, and Holland. His love for God grew and deepened the more he read and the more he studied. The further he traveled, the greater his vision developed of spreading the word of God to all people. One day in Harlem, his friend Lawrence Costa handed him a piece of wood that had lettuce carved on it, wrapped in a piece of parchment. Some of the sap from the green wood had hardened into the relief shape of the letters on the parchment. As Johannes saw the simple plaque of wood, an inspiration flashed in his mind and his heart with the force of lightning. The possibility of producing a machine that could print the word of God welled up inside him. And Gutenberg traveled up the Rhine to Strasbourg. He closed himself in his workroom. He fashioned his own tools and developed plans, tested, tried, reorganized, attempted again and again to produce an effective printing machine. Starting with movable wooden type, he bored through the side of each with a small hole to string together the letters of the alphabet, cut and relief on one side. At the Reformation Museum in Geneva, they've got a monument of, of a printing press, and it's got the sign there, the printing press, the reformer's friend, the tyrant's foe. And that's a good description of it. Johannes Gutenberg seemed to understand something of the immense importance of this invention upon industry, society, and civilization itself. When he contracted a skillful craftsman, Conrad Suspect, to create a full-size version of his scale model, the craftsman responded, but it's just a simple press you're asking from me, Master Hans. Think of a press for wine press. Yes, replied Gutenberg, it is a press, certainly, but a press from which shall flow in inexhaustible streams the most abundant and most marvelous liquor that's ever flowed to relieve the thirst of men. Through it, God will spread his word. A spring of pure truth shall flow from it. Like a new star, it shall scatter the darkness of ignorance, and it shall cause a light hitherto for unknown to shine upon men. Now, if you go to the vineyards in the Cape up near Stellenbosch, you'll see their wine presses resemble the original printing presses, which is why we speak about the press. The press is the printing press, but it comes from the old wine press. Despite his great vision, Johannes was acutely aware of his limitations. A man's got no limitations. He was just one man with very limited resources. He was concerned about his work being discovered and possibly pirated for lesser goals. The printing press is neutral. It could be used to print bad things or good. And so, obviously, he realized this good technology could be used for evil purposes. He worked on the mechanics of printing secretly, moving his workshop into the ruins of an old deserted monastery. He spent sleepless nights wearing himself out in pursuit of his invention. He engraved his movable types in wood and projected casting them 
in metal. He studied hard to find the means of enclosing them in forms, whether of wood or iron, to make the types into wood, words and phrases, lines, and to leave spaces on the paper for later woodcuts to put in the artwork. He invented colored mediums, oily and yet able to dry, to reproduce characters and brushes and dabbers that spread the ink on the letters and boards to hold them and screws and weights to compress them. He invested months and years, he invested an entire fortune in these experiments. There were many disappointments, many failures and frustrations before he developed a model press which combined all the elements for an efficient printing press. And the first book to be printed had to be the Holy Bible. The second was the Psalter. The first book to ever bear date, 1457, was the Psalter. The Psalms which were used for hymn singing in early church. So the oldest book in the Bible, the Gutenberg Bible. We've got a page re reproduced and framed downstairs in our hallway of uh, the first book ever printed, which is in Latin, the Gutenberg Bible. The Gutenberg Bible completed in 1455 in two volumes, because one volume wasn't big enough to contain it all. In Latin was the first book ever published with movable type. Sometimes people say, oh, the Chinese invented the printing press, not Gutenberg. That's nonsense and a lie. The Chinese had a, like ink stamps where you had a, a woodcut that you could stamp an ink and then you could put on a page and so it replicates. That's not a printing press, that's an ink stamp. And the Chinese said that, but a movable type printing press that could be changed to, to produce multiple different forms, newspapers, books, pamphlets, leaflets, that was invented by Gutenberg. Less than 200 copies were originally printed. Only 50 have been thought to have survived to this day. Now, of course, they're very valuable, but in the bombings of Europe in the Second World War, quite a lot of valuable things were destroyed, and so we've only got 50 copies of the a Gutenberg Bible today. And today, the original Gutenberg Bible is considered one of the finest works of art. A two-volume edition of the Gutenberg Bible was sold for over $5 million, highest price ever paid for a book. Now, I don't think anyone's going to pay $5 million for a Harry Potter book or something like that in the future. And uh, this is literally the most valuable book in the world. At first, the Roman Catholic Church opposed the printing press. The Pope called it an um, uh, invention of the devil. For political reasons and for the survival of his invention, Gutenberg wrote a dedication to Pope Paul II on behalf of the printing press. Among the number of blessings which we ought to praise God is this invention, which enables the poorest to procure libraries at a low price. Is it not a great glory that volumes that used to cost a hundred pieces of gold can now be bought for four or less? That the fruits of genius multiply all over the world. Soon Gutenberg could not sustain the demand for printing in a small workshop. He was forced to develop partnerships with successful businessmen, Johann Faust and Peter Schoffer, who unfortunately did not have his integrity. These businessmen hijacked his invention, stole everything, including his type and his machinery. But despite these trials and these betrayals, Gutenberg maintained his integrity and his honor. He maintained a faithful Christian witness to the end, rebuilding from scratch and relaunching despite the hijacking of his invention. Gutenberg's invention of the printing press is rightly classified as one of the greatest events in the history of the world, a real milestone. The printing press prepared the way for the Reformation. The progress of modern science and literature all flows from the invention of the printing press. The printing press became an indispensable tool in the fulfillment of the Great Commission and for the development of universal education. And I think our literature of Africa bears out we couldn't think of our ministry without the printing press having been invented. These vast amounts of Bibles and books that we get to distribute all over Africa, this is all some of the fruits of Gutenberg's printing press. Gutenberg's invention enabled multiplied millions to discover for themselves great literature and most importantly, the Word of God. This one invention made possible the greatest revival of faith and freedom ever experienced. The invention of the printing press played a key role in mobilizing the Reformation. 
Without printing, it's questionable whether it even have been a pr Protestant Reformation. A century before Luther, uh, Wycliffe and Huss had inspired dedicated movements for Bible study and for reform. But the absence of adequate printing technology severely limited the distribution of the writing. Wycliffe did not have a printing press. And so his reformation had limited impact, whereas Martin Luther mastered the printing press. As a result, the ideas did not spread as rapidly or as far as could have been done. And by God's grace, the printing press provided for the reformers Martin Luther, Ulrich Zwingli, William Tyndale, John Calvin, and others with the spiritual weapons they needed to make the Reformation succeed. And we benefit from that today. Interestingly, this is a postcard I picked up in Geneva, and it's got the reformers, Wycliffe, John Calvin, Martin Luther, William Tyndale, Ulrich Zwingli, Christophus Adolphus, the odd man out here, everyone else a theologian, Philip Melanchthon, and Jan Hus. So you've got the seven great reformers and one general and king of Sweden who played a key role in protecting the Reformation uh, from extermination in the 17th century, but that's another story. Here you can see the spread of learning and the growth of printing presses in Europe during the Renaissance. Now, Wittenberg had the greatest, most active printing presses in the world in the time of Martin Luther, and Geneva had the most printing presses back in the times of John Calvin. Here you can see some examples of Martin Luther's printing. Now, how they did woodcuts was someone would have to carve an image on a wood, flat piece of wood, and then space would be left on the pages of printing. So after the printing, they would take a woodcut, dip it in ink, and then stamp the image, the illustration, to fit those spaces. And so the printing press would print with text, but then after the printing, uh, they would add in the illustrations, which is why some of the older publications, you'll see the picture looks skew, sometimes even smudged. Again, that depends on the efficiency of the person operating by hand uh, to put in the woodcut illustrations afterwards. Matthew 28, 19 is so appropriate, making disciples of the nations, teaching obedience to all things. This is what Gutenberg actually achieved. And here's a monument to Gutenberg in Mainz, his birthplace. He's one of the victorious Christians who changed the world chapters in our book, Victorious Christians Who Changed the World. Any questions on Gutenberg, the man of the millennium? It's just, it's so strange that uh, the Bible was originally obviously not written in language people could understand, or could people understand Latin? I don't think. Most people couldn't understand Latin. But Latin was the language of learning so that if you were a king or a priest, you had to learn Latin. I mean, I was... Uh, studying in school in Rhodesia, we were being taught Latin. And I said once, sir, why are we learning Latin and not Madibili or Afrikaans? And the teacher responded, if you don't know Latin, you're not educated. Such a typical pommy arrogance, but there we go. Um, Latin was the language of learning. So it, when the Bible was translated into Latin, it wasn't to hide it, but effectively it became that way when you weren't allowed to translate into any other language. Today you can see a similar thing in, in the Muslim world. The Quran must be in Arabic. You can only pray in Arabic. Arabic is God's language. I even met a um, Muslim who, when he's swearing, I said, are you allowed to swear in um, Islam? And he said, well, not in Arabic, but it's okay in other languages. God only understands Arabic. Which I don't know that that's a orthodox position, but that's the kind of things that I've heard from Muslims. And uh, the Catholics in the Middle Ages had this attitude that God only speaks in Latin and you can only hear in Latin. They'd even forgotten that the Latin translation of the Bible had been translated from Greek. So that's how bizarre it can be. Imagine you can only pray in Latin or you can only read the Bible in Latin. And you could only have a copy of the Bible if you were clergy. And that's how bad it was. It's not actually a language that's spoken by a country. It's not, it's not Italian. You, you invented it. 
Latin comes out of what today is Italian, but modern Italian isn't the same as Latin. Latin was classical uh, in the Roman Empire, yes. Interesting, the very people who crucified Christ, their language became the language of the church. Kind of bizarre. Latin influenced uh, a lot of languages in Europe a lot, except for Germany, because Germany was never conquered by the Roman Empire. So because the Battle of Teutonburg Forest in 9 AD, Germany was one part of Europe that was not influenced by Latin. And the Scandinavian countries too. When was the first um, Bible written in Latin? That would be in the 5th century. 5th century. 5th century, Jerome. So what happened before that? Well, there would have been Greek um, New Testaments and Hebrew Old Testaments. So why was there need to... Well, because of the Roman, Roman Empire officially converted to Christianity. And so Jerome translated the Bible to Latin, which fair enough, was the main language being spoken in the Roman Empire at that time. And the Roman Empire just converted to Christianity. So you understand why it was done, but why they solidified it, and that was it, you couldn't translate into any other language. That was bizarre. But that was reality, and that's why people like John Wycliffe uh, were persecuted, and why um, William Tyndale was burned at the stake for the crime of translating the Bible into English. <laughs> 